What's fueling public anger in Peru? Mass protests calling for change have taken place for five weeks since the former president was impeached and arrested. Peru is no stranger to political crises, so how is this one different? And what will it take to fix it? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Derin Abugeda. Tens of thousands of people are expected to descend on Peru's capital, Lima, for two days of anti-government protests. They want President Dina Boluarte to resign and early elections to be held. Many are supporters of her predecessor, Pedro Castillo, and have a similar background to their former leader. They're indigenous, poor, and come from rural Peru's mountainous regions. They say President Boluarte doesn't represent them. She was appointed when Castillo was removed from office in early December and arrested on charges of rebellion and conspiracy. On the five weeks of demonstrations, more than 40 people have been killed in confrontations with security forces. We are from Chota in Cajamarca. We've come to Lima to defend our country, considering we are under a dictatorial government, a militarist government, which has stained our country with blood. My outrage, my only rage, is because Dina Bularte is to blame. Dina, please resign so the people calm down. If you don't resign, the people won't surrender. Let the whole of Peru rise up. Let the 25 provinces rise up. Let 10% of the population come here to Lima because the government is illegitimate. Well, President Boluarte says she's willing to talk to the demonstrators, but that they must gather peacefully. This issue of demanding early elections is only an excuse to keep taking over highways and blocking roads. Please, we want to work in peace. People in southern Peru are desperate to have their highways cleared. They want to work to reactivate their economies. Joining me now, our guests in Lima, is Juan Claudio Lechen, who's a political analyst, writer and playwright. His father, Juan Lechen Oquendo, was the former vice president of Peru. In New York is Michael Shifter, who's a senior fellow at the Inter-American Dialogue and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Joining us from London is Alonso Germendi, a lecturer in international relations at Oxford University and author of a book on humanitarian law in Peru's post-conflict reconciliation process. Welcome to you all. Thanks so much for your time with us on uh, Inside Story. Uh, Juan Claudio, over in Lima, just give us an assessment of these protests taking place right now, which have, uh, the protesters have made their way to the capital, Lima. What have you been seeing and what's your assessment of it all? Well, yes, uh, approximately 1,000 or more than 1,000 people are coming to Lima in this moment from different parts of the, of the provinces in buses, rented buses, and uh, they want to take Dina Boluarte down. They want her to resign. Uh, it's a political um, demand, and all demands are political. They want a new constitution. They want Dina Boluarte to resign. They want elections uh, closer um, uh, in this 2023. So uh, the, the complete situation is a political situation. It's not a social situation as is presented by some media. Uh, for me, it looks very much like the offensive because I'm Bolivian. Uh, I lived in Peru for more than 10 years and also in Venezuela, but um, I see the same situation that happened in Bolivia in 2020 when President Añez was taken out from government and she was uh, made to resign, also with an offensive of, of this type, with this kind of look of social movement, when in fact was a political mo movement to overthrow her. So in general, uh, I, I think more this of being a political offensive to take Boluarte down rather than a social demand from the people. OK, just one for uh, you, uh, one more for you, uh, Juan Claudio. Uh, do you think that the protests are getting big enough to actually force 
uh, the change that people are looking for? You say the protesters are demanding that Baluarte resign and they're also demanding uh, early elections. Well, it's very difficult to say if she has the guts to stay, she can stay because she has the army and the police and she has the backup of, uh, I would say, more than approximately of 80% of the population. The difference is that this 80% of the population is not mobilized, is not in the streets, whereas the other part, the, the radical part, is being mobilized with this uh, all this um, offensive with buses and people coming from everywhere with a very aggressive and violent um, recently um, actions. So it's it's very difficult to say if she is going to resign given this uh, Lima taking, this Lima uh, offensive today and tomorrow. Okay, let's bring in Michael Shifter from New York. Do you think that this is a dangerous moment for Peru going forward or does it represent an opportunity uh, for real change? I, it strikes me as a very, very dangerous, uh, ominous situation in Peru. Uh, I could get completely out of control. Um, clearly, um, what started as a set of protests in the South uh, following the um, the impeachment of Pedro Castillo uh, after he attempted a self-coup on December 7th um, has spread. Uh, I think that the response of the government has made matters worse, has angered people even more, has created more resentment, and, um, and has morphed into something larger. Um, and I think really reflects a lot of the pent up um, uh, anger and resentment that people in the South have had that have that they really haven't uh, enjoyed the fruits of a, of a country that really, let's remember, has had very um, high growth rates uh, for many years. And yet there's been uh, really an abysmal um, lack of social investment and commitment to the social agenda. So it's become something uh, much broader. And I think the government hasn't reacted very well. And uh, the Congress certainly it wants to cling uh, to their positions and also um, are not, do not want to be flexible in terms of early, earlier elections, which is one of the principal demands of the protesters. So I think this is a this is a very dangerous moment that I think needs to be, um, you know, addressed, and hopefully uh, things will calm down. I don't really see the opportunity uh, right now to do something dramatic in a positive way. I think Boluarte could try to change the cabinet, um, and that might uh, help, but um, she's very, very unpopular. Uh, she's a constitutional president, followed all the procedures, but she's very unpopular. She's tied to the Congress. She's tied to a military that has committed a lot of abuses and a lot of innocent people have been killed, which is which is just unacceptable. Yeah, and speaking of the response by the government, uh, Michael, uh, Boluarte uh, has cracked down harshly. At least 47 protesters have been killed uh, so far. Why do you think there's been such a heavy-handed response? Uh, I think this is, this, you know, this is Peru. Uh, I lived in Peru for four years during the years of Shining Path in the late 80s and early 1990s. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, um, the, the security forces have a record of human rights abuses. That's why there's a strong human rights movement uh, in Peru. And there's also just uh, this mistreatment uh, of uh, the indigenous people, of poor people in the South. Now, a lot of these people also bear a huge responsibility. Policemen have been, it's a policeman that was burned alive. There have been violence um, that is also unacceptable. And so the security forces uh, have a responsibility to restore public order, to protect innocent citizens from violence. But there's no justification for the abuses that have been reported, the people that have been killed um, that were uh, protesting peacefully or were just happened to be in that, in that area. Okay. That's unacceptable. All right, Alonso, um, over in London, uh, my guest from uh, Lima, Juan Claudio, a moment ago was saying that this is a pretty much a political offensive, uh, what's taking place in Peru right now. Do you agree with that assessment? And um, just give me your initial thoughts about the situation. Yes, thank you. I, I, I don't think I agree uh, because so the, the political situation in Peru has several layers. 
and we can discuss um, you know the surface level analysis of specifically uh, Castillo's coup, the reaction to it, and the specific the specificity of the current moment. But if you peel off the layers, if you look a little bit more further down into the social order of things, the social contract, the history of the country, then this can't just be about uh, one specific moment in 2023 or 2022. Uh, there is a longer history of exclusion um, of people from indigenous descent and indigenous people in Peru having been left out by this you know, economic growth, economic miracle that Michael was talking about, where even if you know GDP is growing and the macroeconomics numbers are doing well, um, people, every day people are basically left alone if they cannot privatize their basic needs. There's, there's no good health care, there's no uh, public housing, there's educate, public education is not very well funded and it's not uh, doing well for people. So the population feels that there's a double standard, a double system. And all of these protests boil down to this difference between the part of Peru that is able to take advantage of the quote-unquote economic miracle and the part of Peru that isn't, that is still left behind uh, by a system that privileges that which is in Lima, is Western-looking and um, you know, uh, in, it connected to international capitalism, whereas in the, in the highlands, in the Andes, in the south, in the areas that are most uh, angry with uh, the government and the status quo uh, are not. They are not able to take advantage of these, you know, uh, benefits. Let me put this to you, Alonso, because some people say that this crisis has been enhanced by 30 years of neoliberalism. And in fact, the constitution that was put in place back in 1993 by Fujimori really implemented that neoliberal economic model, uh, which has just benefited uh, the rich and the businessmen at the expense of some people in Peru. Is that an accurate assessment? Do you see it that way? So, uh, look, I don't think we have a particularly uh, extremist constitution. I don't think the constitutional text is um, necessarily the only problem. It has several problems. But there is, you know, ways to work around constitutional texts in the Peruvian constitution. It's, it's not like, the, for example, the Chilean constitution that was very much Chicago boy libertarianism. Um, the Peruvian constitution has tools in there to produce the kind of systems that, that, that would be able to uh, help people. In fact, um, there, poverty has, re has been reduced. The problem is that um, this emerging middle class is very precarious right now, and it's very easy for them to go back into poverty. So what we need is to make changes in the constitution so that these provisions, this idea of safety nets, of healthcare, of education, of safety, are actually actually exist in practice. And they don't because of the mentality in the country that privileges um, these, what you describe as, you know, Washington consensus dynamics in a text that doesn't necessarily mandate those. We could have a different system that is more inclusive. But we can't because of the structures in place. So what we need actually is a conversation as a nation, a national debate, where we accept, uh, and particularly Lima, uh, the westernized parts of Lima, um, it goes through some contrition of right. noticing that the status quo hasn't worked for everyone. Okay, let's bring in Juan uh, Claudio, because I know that you want to comment on, on what my guest from London has been saying. And also, how comparable, I know you compared the situation in Peru to uh, Bolivia a little earlier on, but how comparable would it be, for example, to con a country like Chile, where three years ago we saw protests taking place, and that then eventually led to a, a, a constitutional reform process. W will Peru head in that direction at any point? Uh, yeah, probably uh, it's a it's a possibility. Yes, and still, uh, the Chilean situation was also a political situation. So the the protesters demanded a new constitution that uh, brought a new government, a government from the left. So it's not that uh, the constitution will change the people's wealth or 
will variate in equality. Uh, what Alonso um, describes in his uh, intervention is a third world situation. It's good for Bolivia, for Peru, privileges. It, the thing is that always we speak about privileges when we refer to the West, to the democratic West. Once we go to the non-Western countries, so as to say, Cuba, nobody talks about the privileges in Cuba. Nobody talks about the gap between the people in power and the people in, in uh, the, the, the normal people, poverty. So uh, I think there is a general speech to condemn these countries like Peru that has done mm, a very uh, intense job for the last 30 years to diminish poverty. And he has succeeded, and Peru has succeeded. Well, it doesn't have succeeded in a Swedish uh, standard, but it has diminished extreme poverty very much. And of course, the last 10 years were governments of the left that were away from entrepreneurial attitudes. The last 10 years were uh, governments that were more state oriented than market oriented. And then you have the conclusion that the last 10 years poverty has increased. So it's a, now the Boluarte who was a former leftist uh, companion with Castillo. Now that Castillo was taken out of power, she's a, tagged as a far leftist woman but she was like one month ago from the left. So they want to capture power again. I don't think that these long-term diseases of a third world country like poverty, not water, uh, and all these uh, long right. to-dos that we still have in the third world are the cause. It's a current tactical cause for the moment to change the government to uh, radicalize the situation. Michael, would it be fair to say that what's led to the situation is that, you know, there, there was perhaps some uh, people would describe it as incompetence on behalf of Castillo because perhaps of a lack of uh, presidential experience, but also Congress continuously put obstacles in his face and in front of him to make sure that he couldn't rule. And that's what got us to the situation today. I think that's true. I, I would add a word uh, to incompetence, which is corruption, which I think hasn't been mentioned so far in the discussion, which I think is an important element. It's important to know that every single elected president in Peru since Fujimori, and obviously including Fujimori, who's still in jail for human rights and corruption charges, has been charged with corruption. And um, this is what, if you want to know why people are angry and are full of resentment, it's because, um, and Castillo was no different. There were six investigations by the prosecutor against Castillo. So he's not only incompetent because he had no experience, but he also, uh, he was corrupt like his predecessors. And uh, I think that that was also a very important factor in, uh, in why there was this antagonistic uh, relationship with Congress. But what you say is exactly true. Um, it shows that there was uh, the hard right in Peru never accepted Castillo as legitimate. And he won the election fair and square. It was very, very close against Keiko Fujimori, but he was the legitimate elected president of Peru. And the fact that there was a sector of the hard right that was never recognized him and trying to undermine him also shows that we were dealing with a non-democratic uh, important part of, uh, of the Congress as well. Not the whole Congress, but I think uh, a certain a certain sector of the Congress. Michael, let so me ask you, you just about the United States, back. since you speak to us from New York. Uh, we know that, and let's look at this, some of the international response, because at least 14 countries right across Latin America and the Caribbean have condemned uh, the coup in Peru. They've come out in support of Castillo. But then you have the United States, for example, uh, which is throwing its support behind the Dina uh, Boluarte um, unelected uh, presidency. So to what, what is the U.S.'s stake in all of this? Well, I think, I think Dina Boluarte is, is the constitutional. She was vice president. And if the president is impeached, then the vice president assume, assumes uh, the power. And that, that's, 
totally constitutional. I think that what the, what her mistake was from the outset was that she said in her first speech that she was going to complete the term of Pedro Castillo, which is 2026. And that made absolutely no sense because everybody knew, if you look at any single poll in Peru, that the vast majority of Peruvians wanted elections right away, not at the end of the term. So I think she's made a lot of mistakes. Look, there are no good options. The U.S. was not going to support Castillo. He attempted to coup. He, he, over, to, he closed the Congress and uh, take over the judiciary. So that was, I think, something that deserved to be condemned. But uh, 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 Boluarte has not made has not managed this situation uh, very well, and certainly the armed forces, the security forces with human rights violations, has only fueled the protests and the anger and and got us to the very uh, dangerous point where we are today. Alonso, how do you see this playing out? Well, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, um, the political establishment uh, in Lima is. Um, unable or more likely unwilling to understand the root cause of the protest. They seem to be convinced that this is just a quote-unquote terrorist attack um, on the country with no legitimacy and that it needs to be responded through sheer force, causing the 50 dead uh, bodies that we have now in the country. So, Unfortunately, I don't see this playing out in any way that is uh, peaceful, not at least for some time. Um, and I actually think um, the country, what, what the country requires is a longer process of national discussion about how to change the system, how to change the status quo so that it includes everyone. Because it is not possible to tell 10, 15, 20% of the population, well, yes, the state has succeeded, Poverty has been reduced. There is there is no extreme poverty, but but people do not need to just be content with not being poor, right? People need more than just non-poverty. So how does there the indigenous be... majority get representation then, Alonso? So this is the 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 proposal that exists right now from indigenous peoples themselves, um, from you know, Bolivia and uh, Chile, both. Uh, attempts to reform the constitution is to establish plurinational states, as in, whereas the nation state is usually seen as one nation, one state, uh, recognize that the history of Latin America is a history where several nations coexist and have equal rights and deserve equal representation in Congress and a more decentralized structure uh, in politics. Unfortunately, when when this is when this was proposed um, in, in Chile, um, I, I, I would argue lack of uh, an, a, a space to properly you know, discuss this generated a lot of fear that this was going to break up Chile into several little feuds and the proposal was defeated. Um, it also doesn't help that plurinationality was uh, a, a, one of the big arguments by Evo Morales as he descended into you know, authoritarianism in, in Bolivia. Um, so it doesn't have the right... Um, there hasn't been a proper space to discuss this idea of changing the status quo of, of our countries, which right. is why I think more than a constitution constitutional assembly, what Peru needs is a is a forum uh, of open consultation, cabildos abiertos in Spanish, where the nation can sit together and hear the grievances of the people and know what it feels like to be a Peruvian that doesn't have access to healthcare, that doesn't have access to public education, that is uh, uh, beaten up by the police if they ever complain, um, that you know doesn't have actual safety nets and a state that looks after its population. Okay. That process needs to start. All right. On that note, uh, we'll have to leave it there. We've run out of time, but thank you so much, Juan Claudio Lecce and Michael Shifter and Alonso Gurmendi. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story from myself and the whole team right here in Doha. Thanks very much for watching and bye-bye for now.